Okay. So hello, welcome everybody uh, to our uh, data-driven uh, methods seminar uh, hosted by the Coots Group and Brunton Group at uh, UW, University of Washington. Um, thank you for joining us this morning or this afternoon. Um, our speaker today will be uh, Liliana Borseo, uh, Peter Field Collegiate uh, Professor of Mathematics at University of Michigan. Um, she uh, studied uh, under George Papa Nicolo, uh, no uh, relation. Um, at uh, Stanford uh, and um, did her postdoctoral uh, research at Caltech uh, before joining Rice University, uh, Computational Applied Mathematics. Um, she's currently the um, Peter Field Collegiate Professor at uh, University of Michigan and a SIAM member, uh, very esteemed. Uh, so uh, she'll be talking about uh, wave propagation uh, and machine learning uh, applications there. So. Uh, that's uh, it for me. Uh, why don't you take it away, Lillian? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, indeed, I'm going to, so I work on inverse problems and I actually, it's not machine learning what I'm doing, uh, but it's an application of data-driven reduced order models to inverse scattering. So that's what I want to tell you about. Okay, so, um, so, Okay, here is the sort of the general formulation of the problem. So like I said, I'm talking about an inverse so-called backscattering problem, which is a problem of interest in many applications. Here, I, I give cartoons for two such applications. One, in is, uh, one is in exploration geophysics, and the other one is for non-destructive evaluation of materials. You can see my mouse, right? Okay, so... Um, for simplicity, I'm going to limit the, the, the presentation to the case of uh, uh, scalar waves, that is acoustic waves, which are governed by the wave equation. And the wave field is denoted here by P. Uh, P stands for acoustic pressure in general. Okay, and uh, the inverse problem is to estimate a medium which is modeled by the unknown variable wave speed C in this equation, uh, given measurements that are collected by uh, a collection which is called an array of M sensors, and these sensors play the dual role of sources and receivers. And the measurements, the model of the measurements is shown here. So this is for each time instance T, we have an M by M matrix, which is denoted by this capital M with entries that are given here. Okay, so let me explain how this data gather occurs. So you have the sensor, which is located at XS. So this is the S sensor. The support, the spatial support of this sensor is me measured by this function theta. Often in mathematics, we, 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 we we actually let this to be a Dirac delta, but it doesn't have to be, it's just some function localized. Uh, so this is localized around XS, which is the location of the S sensor. This emits a signal, which is denoted here by F of T. Typically in inverse scattering, this is a pulse. Okay, that is a, du a short duration signal. And this, of course, generates a wave, which is denoted by P index S to remind us that this is for the S source excitation. This wave is then captured at the receiver R, by, which is modeled by this integral. And then we also take this wave and we convolve it in time with the time reverse emitted signal. This kind of uh, processing here, the convolution with the time reverse signal is very typical in imaging, especially in radar. Okay, so from these measurements, we want to find C. Okay, now this inverse scattering problem is an old problem. So why are we still working on it? Okay, so there is a lot of literature. Most of the literature is concerned with a simple problem, simpler problem, which is known as an imaging problem which really all, all it tries to do is to locate the rough part of C that is jumps. So for example, those would model a crack like here or interfaces in the earth. So they define what we call the reflectivity of the medium. So this is the part that is responsible for the dynamics of the wave or in other words, the backscattering. Okay, so there are many methods that work there. Most of them, 
are based on the assumption that we have such rough part, which is located in a known and non-reflecting background, okay? So what I'm going to talk about today is the harder problem, which is called the velocity estimation problem, which is concerned with a quantitative estimate of the coefficient C, which is both the rough and the smooth part, okay? Now, this kind of, uh, of problem is typically formulated as a PD constraint optimization. And the most common formulation, which is very popular in the geophysics community because they are very concerned with this velocity estimation problem, is known as full waveform inversion. And so what one does is it tries to find C by fitting the measurement with the model prediction of the measurements for the search velocity, and the fit is done in the least squares sense. Okay, so this problem is computationally intense, which you know it's it's okay nowadays because of the huge computing power that we have. But the problem with this this formulation is the following. So this this for this problem actually manifests at what you call higher frequencies, but what is called high is relative. So for example, a high frequency in geophysics is like something like four or five hertz. Okay, so they are not so high. Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is that the objective function is non-convex in the smooth part of C. So what this really means in practice is that the objective function has a very complicated topography with many local minima. And what this means is that if you want to, to, uh, to find C by minimizing your, that objective function, you are going to have a hard time unless you have a very good initial guess. And that is very hard to find. Okay. So that's the, the big issue. Okay. So what is done to mitigate this, this, uh, this, uh, this problem? Well, there are various uh, attempts. Uh, so I mentioned here two of them that uh, have gained traction. So the, uh, the first one introduces in a systematic way additional degrees of freedom in the optimization that is due to the group of Bill Symes. And another one is if it measures the data misfit in a different norm, in particular in the optimal trans using the optimal transport or so-called Wasserstein metric. This has been initiated by the group of Bjorn Enquist and uh, has also gained some traction. But all of this is still ongoing. Okay, so nothing is really fully solved. Okay, so we propose a different approach, which uses what we call a data-driven learning of the wave operator. Now, by, uh, so learning is a little, what we mean by learning is a bit different than what is called in uh, the machine learning community. Uh, so what we are trying to do is from the measurements that are made at the sensors, we want to calculate a nonlinear mapping that gives us a reduced order model. I will call it henceforth wrong of the wave operator. Okay, so this is, some sort of approximation of the wave operator. And it's given, it, 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 it's a matrix with special structure that captures the causal wave propagation. So this is what we want to do. And at this point, I want to mention two important things about this, uh, this construction. The first one is that even, sorry, even though the construction involves a nonlinear mapping, we can construct, we can compute it with efficient numerical linear algebra tools in a non-iterative fashion. Okay. And that can be done quite efficiently. And so, you know, that's of course important for inversion. And second of all, is that we can obtain, we think a better formulation for the velocity estimation problem, where instead of fitting data in whatever norm, we are going to fit the reduced order model. Okay. So now here's the outline of what I want to tell you about. So I will begin with the construction of the reduced order model. And in fact, I will talk about two reduced order models that capture the wave propagation in complementary ways. Okay, the first one is the reduced order model for an operator, which is called the wave propagator operator, which maps the wave field from one instant to the next for a uniform in time discretization of the time axis. 
Okay, so this reduced order model, we started working on this and applications of this reduced order model in around 2018. So that's when the first paper came out. So this is in collaboration with Vladimir Druskin, Alexei Mamonov, Mike Zaslavsky, and Jan Zimmerling. And now there is a new reduced order model that we developed the, this year in collaboration with Jocelyn Garnier, with Alexei Mamonov and Jan Zimmerling. And this turns out to be extremely important for the velocity estimation that I talk about today. In fact, if we had no noise to deal with, we would only need a second reduced order model, but you will see that we will need the first reduced order model to deal with noise. Okay, so once I, I explain how to construct these reduced order models, then I will explain how to use them for velocity estimation. Okay, so that's the plan. Now, in order to do this, I have to be a little bit more clear about the mathematical setup, and also I have to do some transformations. Okay, so first of all, from the point of view of analysis and computations, it is beneficial to work in a bounded domain, which I call this domain omega. And now this bounded domain could be a physical domain, that is, we could imagine, a, we could do an inverse scattering in a cavity, or if we don't have that, if we work, for example, in an open environment, then this domain can be introduced using the hyperbolicity of the problem, meaning that since the wave propagates with finite speed over the duration of measurements, we cannot sense what is going out, out there at some boundary, okay? So from now on, the reflecting boundary is modeled by Dirichlet homogeneous boundary conditions. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is that we prefer to work with a wave operator, which is self-adjoint, okay? And what that can be achieved in many ways, one way is to do a similarity transformation like so. So instead of working with the pressure wave, we divide by the wave speed C, and therefore our wave operator becomes this, where the important operator for us is this operator A, which is minus the unknown wave speed Laplacian acting on the wave speed times the field, okay? So this is a self-adjoint positive definite operator. Okay, now, finally, to go hand in hand with the similarity transformation, we are going to take the measurements that are gathered by the, uh, the array of sensors, and we are going to map them into a new set of data, which we call D, okay? So these are matrices with M by M entries, where M is the number of sensors, which, with entries that are defined here. Okay, so when you look at this expression and you compare with what we had previously in the model of the measurements, you see that first of all, we have the division by the wave speed here at the sensor locations, which comes from this similarity transformation, okay? And that's not a big deal because usually in these problems, you know the medium where the sensors lie, okay? So we know these guys. Now, what is really, Interesting here is that I added the field evaluated at negative time, okay? And so this thing here will allow me to work with a wave which is even in time, and that turns out to be very important. Okay, now, why on earth can I do this? Okay, so these data matrices are defined at positive time T. So why can I put negative t here. We don't measure negative t. Well, if you look at the wave equation here, you see that the initial condition is that we have no wave, zero wave before the, the, the excitation, okay? So the wave is going to leave a negative time over the short duration of this pulse f of t. And again, because of hyperbolicity, this wave is only affected by the medium near the sensor, and therefore we can just compute it because we know that medium there. Okay, so from the measurements, which are shown here in red, plus the stuff that is computed at negative time, we can define these data matrices. Okay, so why do we want to do these transformations? 
So now I will explain why. So we basically want to put ourselves in a, in a good framework where we can do the reduce order model construction. So that's the purpose. So first of all, using the fact that we deal with the self-adjoint positive operator A, which we obtained here via the similarity transformation, we know that this operator has a very nice spectral theorem associated with it. So it has uh, positive eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions form an orthonormal basis. Okay. And expanding the solution of the wave equation in this basis, we obtain this expression for this even way. Okay, so this is just a calculation. The expression looks very, very weird because here is the Fourier, uh, the, the Fourier transform of the emitted signal. Okay, and here what I have is I have functions of the operator, which are defined as usual using the spectral decomposition. So for example, this operator cosine is an operator with eigenvalues which are given by cosine of t uh, with eigenvalues which are, uh, are given by the cosine of t square root of the eigenvalues of a and the eigenfunctions are the same as the eigenfunctions of a. Okay, so we have this expression looks a little bit weird, but okay, this is what it is. And if you want at the end, I can show you how to do it. It's just a straightforward uh, calculation which involves expansion of the solution in eigenbasis. Okay, now if I take this expression here and I substitute it in here, and I use the fact that functions of the operator A commute, I can write these data matrices, which I call them in this way. Okay, so now let me explain. So here, what I did, these functions, which I introduced in, red, in green, I, we call them sensor functions. Why we call them sensor functions? We call them sensor functions because we can prove that they are localized near the location of the sensor. So for example, this one is associated with a source S. So we can prove that it's localized around XS, okay? And in fact, they can be computed again in the vicinity of the sensors where we know the medium, okay? Now, so these are called sensor functions. The, Time dependence is contained in this operator, which is the cosine of t square root of a. This is a beautiful operator for us because you will see that it will allow us to do an explicit exact time stepping of the wave. Okay. And so that's, you know, that's the reason why we do these transformations. And the other thing to notice is that we have a very nice inner product, symmetric inner product expression of these data matrices. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is because I don't like to use all these indices for the receiver, for the sensors and so on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to work with block algebra. Okay, so I'm going to take all the sensor functions corresponding to source one, source two up to source M, and I define this, what I call the sensor vector. So this is a row vector field with M components, okay? And then using the expression that I had on the previous slide, I can define for each time T the data matrices. I can write them this way, okay? So I just want to emphasize, okay, because I get always questions like this. So I don't change the problem, okay? So this D of T is computed from the measurements, okay? So all I'm doing is I'm just, manipulating mathematically how this D looks like. So it, it can help me, it can guide me in constructing the reduced order model. Okay, that's all I'm doing. Okay, this guy is measured plus computed here. Okay, so these data matrices can be written like this. So I can think of, and what I'm doing here, I'm introducing this wave U of T of X, which is given here which this wave is, again, it's written in block algebra. So this is a, a row vector wave, which satisfies the homogeneous wave equation with initial state U naught, okay, which is determined, which corresponds to the sensor functions. 
And because this is a because this is a even time wave, okay, that's the cosine. I have the zero initial condition for the derivative. Okay, so this is the wave that I'm going to talk about today. And what we measure can be mapped to these matrices that are given by this U naught transpose. Uh, I mean, by U naught essentially inner product with this wave U. Okay. So now to construct the reduced order model, I would like to first write the wave propagation as a discrete time dynamical system. Okay. So what we are doing now is we are taking the time axis and we are discretizing it at some interval tau, which has to be chosen according to the Nyquist rule, whatever. Okay, and what I'm doing now is I'm defining what we call the snapshot. Okay, so those of you that work in reduced order modeling in this group are going to be very familiar with the terminology. So uj is, is the wave u evaluated at the j time instant. And according to the formula for u, this is given by the cosine j tau, which is the discrete sample uh, time sample, square root of a acting on the initial state, which is the sensor functions. Okay, now using the trigonometric identity of the cosine, which is cosine of j plus one plus cosine of j minus one is equal to two times cosine blah, blah. So that's the trigonometric identity we can write an exact time-stepping scheme for these snapshots, okay? Which is shown here, where this P is an operator, which we call the propagator operator, which is given by the cosine of tau square root of A. Okay, so what this propagator operator does is it takes the wave, the snapshot at instant J minus Y, J minus one, and the snapshot at time at in the uh, instant j and maps it to the next instant snapshot. Okay, so everything, all the information is about the medium is in this operator. And now what I want to show you is that we can construct a reduced order model of this operator from these data matrices that we evaluate at two n time instants. Okay. So that's my job, the next job. Okay, now how we construct this reduced order model. So the reduced order model is what is known as a Galerkin projection reduced order model. And what I'm doing here, I'm just writing the typical Galerkin formulation. So we want to do Galerkin projection of this exact time stepping scheme on the space, which I call S, which is spanned by the first N snapshots. Okay, remember that I'm in block algebra here. So all of these guys, so U0, U1, and so on, they are row vectors with N components. So therefore, this is a row, this what I call capital U here, where I, I gather together all the first N snapshots is a row vector of length n times m. They are supposed to be linearly independent and that depends on how I choose my time sampling tau. And I want to approximate using Galerkin method um, on this space, okay? Which I don't know, okay? So for now, just pretend that you know it and uh, just think of it like that. Now, the Galerkin approximation is as usually written as a linear combination of the base of the functions in the space, which is what I wrote here. And this GJ is the matrix of coefficients. Again, because of the matrix algebra, these are block matrices like that. And they are, so we call them the Galerkin coefficient matrices. And they are calculated such that when we take this approximation, we stick it in here, we get a residual and we want the residual to be orthogonal to the approximation space, okay? So this is the typical Galerkin formulation. And when you do that, you obtain the time-stepping scheme in the Galerkin framework, which is shown here. And here are the coefficients. The Gs are the coefficients. 
And the M and the S are called in this language the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix. And so there are N times M, N times M, times N times M matrices with blocks given by integrals of these snapshots, like that. Okay, and here, of course, the stiffness matrix depends on the propagator. Okay, so now let me pause a little bit and explain how is this different than what is out there in the literature. There, I mean, there are many papers written on Galerkin projection reduced order models, okay? And here, what I want to emphasize are the differences. Okay, so first of all, usually what one does in reduced order models is one starts with a sort of a large approximation space, which is known, okay? So this space S is known, and usually one has many snapshots. In fact, they could be redundant. That is, they may not be linearly dependent, okay? And then what one does in reduced order modeling is it tries to compress this information via what is called proper orthogonal decomposition, which is an SVD idea, okay? Now here, what we do is, first of all, we are not interested in compressing information, okay? So our snapshots are supposed to be linearly independent, which, which requires proper sampling in time. And what is really important is that we don't know the snapshots. We do not know this space, okay? We do not know this. What we know are the data matrices D. That's all we know, sampled at the first two n time sample. So we only know these guys, okay? We don't know the space. Okay, so that is the big difference. So we only know these data matrices and from them, we want to find the reduced order model. So that's one big difference. The second big difference is that because of our transformations and the fact that we brought the problem to this cosine of the operator, we have an exact time-stepping scheme. What one usually does when one constructs reduced order models for wave equations, one usually does finite difference approximations of the second derivative in time, okay? We don't do that. We have an exact time-stepping scheme. And because of that, and because of the definition of the approximation space, what that really means is that if you look at the Galerkin approximation for the first and time instance, this approximation is exact, okay? Because the time stepping scheme is exact, the residual is zero, okay? So we have an exact approximation for the first time, st uh, time st uh, steps. Meaning in particular that the Galerkin coefficients are just blocks, block columns of the identity matrix, okay? So the first Galerkin coefficient, so they are trivial, okay? And you will see that this also results in the reduced order model having, uh, which I has, still have to define, having very good approximation properties. Okay, so now the question is how on earth can we construct a reduced order model when we, as a Galerkin projection, if we don't know the space? We only know this. So the key here is this equation. So remember that by construction, we already know that the first Galerkin coefficients are trivial. They are just block columns of the identity matrix. Now, the second observation is that even though the approximation space is not known, the mass and stiffness matrices in these Galerkin equations are data-driven. And here is this long slide. I apologize for this, but I wanted to show you how you can do that. Okay, so starting with the definition of the mass matrix. So here, what I did is I just wrote the ij block of the mass matrix. So this is the definition, integral of the i snapshot transpose acting on uj. Okay, so this is an m by m block. Okay, now what I do here is I write what is the mathematical expression of this snapshot, okay? Now, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to use that a is a self-adjoint operator. And so th since this is a self-adjoint operator, I can move this operator over here like this. Now I have a product of cosines for which I have a trigonometric identity, okay? Which is what I wrote here. And when I look here, I realize, oh, 
But cosine I plus J acting on U naught is just the I plus J snapshot and similar for this one. And so what this is, is exactly the data matrix at instant I plus J plus the data matrix at instant I minus J. Okay, so even though we don't know these snapshots, we can construct this mass matrix and similarly the stiffness matrix. Okay, from the data. So we don't, we, we don't know the approximation space, but all of a sudden we can do everything in terms of the time stepping in the Galerki space. Okay, now what we want to do is to compute the reduced order model. What the reduced order model is, so it's the reduced order model of the, of the propagator operator, this operator. The reduced order model is defined as a projection of this operator onto the Galerkin space. To do a projection, I would like to use an orthonormal basis. That's the best way to do projections. Now, there are many ways to compute an orthonormal basis if you know the approximation space, which I don't, okay? So for now, pretend that we know the approximation space, which is defined by the span of the entries in this U, okay? And let's try to construct an orthonormal basis by using a gram schmidt orthogonalization procedure. Now, from the point of view of wave propagation, the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization is very nice because the orthonormal basis, which is stored in this vector function V, okay, so the components of this are the orthonormal functions which define the orthonormal basis. Because of Gram-Schmidt, this is causal. So in other words, if I look at the J's block column of V, because we work in block algebra, this is in the span of the first snapshots like that, okay? And that is reflected by the fact that this matrix R is block upper triangle, okay? So I'm defining the orthonormal basis using Gram-Schmidt, okay? But now, wait a minute, I don't know U and therefore I don't know the orthonormal basis V. But the point here is that in this equation, I know R. So R is data-driven. Why is it data-driven? Well, here, I just showed you that the mass matrix can be computed from the data. Here is the definition of the mass matrix, okay? Now, what I'm doing, I'm putting the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization here in U. And here is what I get. Now, because the V is an orthonormal basis, this is just the identity matrix. And I got that the mass matrix is R transpose R. So R is nothing else but the Cholesky square root of M. Okay, so U is not known, V is not known, but R can be computed from the data. Okay, so here comes the reduced order model of the propagator operator. So it is the projection of the true operator, the true propagator using the orthonormal basis. So here it is. So it's an N, N times M uh, times N times M uh, matrix, which is defined like this. Now, again, what I'm doing is I'm using the Gram-Schmidt scheme. So I'm writing V in terms of U and R, and I obtain this expression. And everything that is written in, uh, in red is data-driven. So R is computed from the data, S is the stiffness matrix that can be computed from the data, as I showed you. So even though we don't know the approximation space, we have the reduced order model propagator. Okay, moreover, we can get a time stepping in the reduced order model step uh, space. So that we just take the data-driven equation, uh, a time stepping in the Galerkin formulation, and we multiply on the left by R inverse transpose, and then we get the time stepping in the reduced order model space. It looks just like the one in the exact space, of course. Now, so this, instead of the operator P, now we have the projection and the snapshots in the ROM space are the projection of the Galerkin function, which are shown here. 
Okay. And note again, because of the construction that we have, uh, because we have a, a exact time stepping and so on, I remind you that the first Galerkin coefficients are trivial. They are just block columns of the identity matrix. So you can see that the first ROM snapshots are just block columns of this R. Okay, so let me tell you a few properties of the reduced order model. So first of all, the reduced order model has very good approximation properties, unusually good for Galerkin projection type reduced order models. And that's again, because of the exact time stepping scheme and the construction that we have. In particular, we have exact data match. Okay, so this is, uh, I can show you at the end how you can prove that this is actually a non-trivial thing, but uh, it holds for our reduced order model. Moreover, what is important for this talk is that there is causality built in this, into this construction and causality comes in, first of all, because of the time stepping and also because of the causal construction of the orthonormal basis using Gram-Schmidt. And that reflects in the fact that the ROM matrix p -ROM, has a block tridiagonal structure, okay? That's, again, we can prove that. I don't include the proof. What I mean by this, that it's causal. Well, so remember, as I just said, that the first ROM snapshots are just block columns of this block upper triangular matrix R, which is the Cholesky factor of the mass matrix. So here is the first snapshot. Here is how it looks like. So it's a, it's a matrix with M columns and N times M rows. The first block is only non-zero and everything else is zero. Now, if you go to the second, uh, to the next snapshot, which is mapped from the initial snapshot by the ROM propagator, which is a tridiagonal matrix, this is how this guy looks like and so on. And as you proceed, you so on. So you see as time increases, so this is time instant zero, time instant one, time instant two and so on. We have filling of the rows of the blocks. What this capture is the algebraic way of capturing the propagation of the wavefront away from the sensors. Initially, the wave is at the sensors. Okay, so only this guy is not zero. It, at the next time step, the wavefront moves inside the medium and that's captured by this block filling and so on. Okay, so this is what we call cause. Now, moving on to the next reduced order model. So what we want is to use the reduced order model to extract from it the unknown wave speed. So it is not so easy to, cons to extract C out of this reduced order model because the dependence of this reduced order model on C is really complicated, okay? so. A is this operator which depends on C in a simple way. But then we take the square root of A, then we take the cosine, then we project, okay? So this is a very complicated thing. It would be much better if we had this kind of reduced order model where we could project A directly. So this would be an approximation of this operator. And hopefully if the space is good enough, this guy will, behave closely to what this guy does. So the simple dependence on C should be inherited by this a -ROM. The problem is how do you construct this a -ROM? So we have p -ROM. I showed you how we can get it. It's a very nice reduced order model with excellent approximation properties, but it's not easy to get a -ROM out of p -ROM. We know how to do functional calculus in the continuum using the spectrum of A, but if we just compute the spectrum of P ROM, that is not the spectrum of P. Huh? It's only in the, in the projection space. So in our words, the eigenvalues of P ROM are what one calls the reads values of P, okay? So in particular, this is not true. So we cannot write P ROM is the cosine of tau square root of A ROM, okay? So we cannot get, get A ROM like that. However, 
We have the following observation. So let us introduce a new stiffness matrix. I call it S tilde to distinguish it from the previous one. So if we knew this matrix S tilde, which is defined here, now here what I did is I used again the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization scheme, which is U is equal to orthonormal basis, which is in V times R. Okay, so when I look at this equation, I realize, oh, so this S tilde is given by R transpose, which I can compute from data, A rho, which is what I want, times R. So if I can compute this S tilde from the data, I can get A rho out of this. Okay, so this is possible, and this is what I'm showing here. So I write the ij block of this S tilde here. Okay, again, I write the definition of the snapshots. Again, I use the fact that operators of A commute and A is self adjoint, and I obtain this expression, this expression here. Now, again, I use the trigonometric identity of the cosine. And I get this expression. But what is A U? U solves the homogeneous wave equation. So U A U is minus the second time derivative of U. So what we get is that the entries of S tilde I J are nothing but the uh, but what I write here. So what we need is the second derivative of the data matrices evaluated at this time instance. And this can be calculated, for example, via Fourier transform, via filter Fourier transform. That's what we are doing in our simulations. Okay, so that is how we can construct the ROM operator. And now, what properties does this ROM operator have? So the ROM operator, uh, a ROM, is, has actually much it's not as good as approximating the wave, the waves in approximating the wave snapshots as the uh, as the propagator. Okay, it approximates them, but it it's, it doesn't. For example, it doesn't give exact data fit. Okay, nevertheless, it's better for for uh, velocity estimation. Now, what about algebraic structure of a ROM? So why this? ROM propagator is a matrix which is block diagonal for a ROM. We don't have a special structure. It is a full matrix. It is a matrix for which we can prove that the, the entries decay away from the main, main diagonal, but it is a full matrix. So what that really means is that if you think of this ROM as sort of like a, some sort of a special discretization of your wave equation, you see that you have a very complicated scheme because this is a full matrix, right? It's not a simple stencil like a two point, a three, uh, like a you know five point stencil or something like that. It's a complicated stencil. Okay. Now, what is really important for us is because the basis in V is causal, we can prove that if we don't take all the data matrices. So if we work with the first, with a subset of the data. Okay, then these determine the upper left block of this operator. And this is very beneficial for, for inversion because what this means is that we can take the data, the big data that we have, and then we can take a portion of it, just, you know, window it, and then use the reduced order, the, this block of the reduced order model to invert for the medium near the sensors. Okay, when we are happy with what we did, then we can put more data in and proceed like this in the layer tilde fashion. Okay, so the inversion that we propose is for a data set like this, if I want to use all the data, I make k is equal to n. If I want to use only a subset of the data, I have k less than n. We propose to find the wave speed by doing this minimization where this guy here is data driven computed as i showed you and this one is computed for the search velocity v by solving the forward problem generating the data matrices for this v and then computing the row okay so now it's time to show you some results so the first thing i want to illustrate 
why using this reduced order model could be beneficial. So what I'm doing here is I want to, to show you how the objective function looks like for the conventional waveform inversion method, which is minimize the data fit in this square sense, or the, uh, our approach where we minimize the, the reduced order model fit. Okay, so because we want to visualize the objective function, we are in a two parameter self space. So here is the true medium. So it consists of two values of the velocity. We have a fast medium shown here in red, which has wave speed three uh, kilometers per second, and a slower medium which has half the wave speed above. And we have this interface here. And in order to plot the objective function, I need all, I can only have two parameters because I can only plot in two dimensions. And so what I'm doing here is I'm going to keep the inclination of this uh, of this interface fixed, and I'm going to move the interface up and down. So that is one uh, one uh, parameter. And the other parameter is the contrast between the wave speed here and here, okay? And this is the objective function for the conventional approach, and this is the objective function for our approach. And as you can see, so this is very well known, the objective function here, it's, you know, it's pretty rough, has lots of local minima, whereas here the objective function is smooth, and, uh, and uh, you see we, you know, it looks convex, okay? So by the way, here, we actually don't have in the search space the exact location, which is why you don't see um, a minimum at the true location, okay? So you see that you know, the objective function changes quite quickly here. Okay, so this is the first idea. Now, I want to show you the first inversion. So this is a, this is a, a problem uh, this is a challenge problem that is very well known in geophysics. It's called the Camembert example. And it was cooked up. Why, why is it called the Camembert example? Because as you can see, it was cooked up by French people. And second of all, it, it's, as you will see, uh, the, the, the behavior of the, uh, the traditional waveform inversion, that is the data fit uh, in least square sense, Basically, what it can do, it can only find this top interface, and then it sort of gives you like a melt away from here. So it melts like a camembert cheese. Okay, so here is a, we did an honor search. So we, this is the search space, which is parameterized by some functions. Five, we actually choose Gaussians because we like to use with a sort of a smooth velocity field. Uh, actually, we are over parameterizing here, so the standard deviation is, is small, okay, um, and uh, therefore we introduce some regularization here. This is Tikhonov regularization with properly chosen Tikhonov parameter, and I'm going to show you the results um, for both approaches, so our approach and the traditional method. And to do the inversion, we proceed in six layers. So we feed data in six layers. And so you will see how we, we get. OK, so we have 10 iterations for, uh, for each layer. So I show you the layer 10, 20, 40, and 60. And you can see that, so our approach is on the top. You can see that, you know, as we add more data, the, the thing improves and we can recover the camembert pretty well. This is the traditional approach. So you see the, the melting camembert. Okay, so why is doing is this doing uh, why is this? Because the optimization got stuck in a local mean. Okay, and so that's that. Now, what about noise? So what regularization do we have? Right now, we only have regularization here, but this regularization only takes into account the fact that, you know, we over-parameterize the search velocity. But what about, but we need to take care in the construction of a ROM, okay? So that has to be regularized. What is the problematic step in the ROM construction? So the stiffness matrix S, is constructed from the data by a linear operation, okay? So you have small noise that just passes through, you know, 
like it's a linear operation, okay? The problem is this one, R inverse. So R is the block Cholesky square root of the data-driven matrix M, and then we need the inverse of that. Okay, so that's the problem. Now, due to noise, M will not be symmetric. That's easy to fix. You just take M plus M transpose divided by two. What is worse is that it will not be positive definite. Okay, so then we need to regularize. Okay, so we regularize using standard eigenvalue decomposition. So this is the eigenvalue decomposition of the symmetric matrix M. And we know that the spectrum is stable for eigenvalues which are larger, larger than the noise level. So that's what we do. We keep the eigenfunctions that correspond to eigenvalues larger than the noise level. There is an intelligent way uh, you know, to estimate what that is. Okay. So we keep them in this ZR and then we do a projection. So we have a, a, small mass, a smaller mass matrix. And then we say, okay, well, you know, take square root and let's go. It doesn't work this. So I have to confess it took us a long time to figure out how to do this. Why it doesn't work? So the success of this reduced order modeling methodology that we developed is causality. So the causal construction, the algebraic structure is very important. So yes, this matrix M is now, you know, has a good spectrum. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, we can take square root, inverse of square root in a stable way, but we lost causality. We have to get causality back by doing a transformation of coordinates, okay, after regularization. How to do that? It's not clear if we just look at this Aero matrix because we don't know much about the structure of this matrix. We only know that it's a full matrix with entries that decay away from the diagonal. That's not very helpful. However, we know a lot about the structure of the reduced order model for the propagator. We know that causality is reflected in the fact that this matrix is block tridiagonal. And this matrix is constructed from the same mass matrix as Aero. So once we regularize the mass matrix, we are affecting both this one and this one in the same way. So what we do is we construct p -ROM after regularization, and then we do a change of basis, excuse me, to bring p -ROM in, in, in a, a block tridiagonal form using a transformation which is known as the block Lanchos algorithm, okay? And once we do this transformation, we use that transformation on a ROM and everything works again. And so now I'm going to show you a, a, big, a bigger example. So this is a big challenge problem. It's known as the Marmusi model in geophysics. This is the true velocity that one wants to find. This is the initial velocity. Actually, our approach, uh, so in general, if you look in the literature in geophysics, one takes this guy and smooths it using a, a low pass filter, and that's the initial guess, okay? So what we did here, we did a little bit better. So we took this layered thing, which is not the smoothed version of that. In fact, we checked that we actually converge, even if we start with a constant initial velocity, but then the convergence is slow huh? and the computations are a little bit intense. Okay, so here is the, uh, the traditional approach here. Here is our approach. As you can see, uh, the traditional approach does a good job in finding the first interfaces. You see here, it captures correctly the first interfaces, but then it gets stuck in some local minimum. And what you have here is not at all what should be. Whereas what we have is good. Of course, here at the bottom, we are not doing so well. And that is because here is, we cutting data at time corresponding to the round trip travel time from the central source to the bottom and back. Okay, so if you add more data, you're going to do a better job here. But anyway, you can see that we recovered basically all the features. Okay, so this is uh, just to show you, this is just sort of, a, I took some uh, vertical slices in here to show you better. Uh, so you see that we do a good job, except at the bottom where 
you know, if we had more data, we would do better. Okay, so I would like to, to end now. I want to show you that. So basically, I wanted to show that, you know, ideas from reduced order modeling, in particular, um, uh, Galerkin type projection reduced order models can be used with care in inverse scattering uh, cases. So we sort of like, uh, uh, modified the well-known constructions in the literature to fit our purpose, uh, you know, to, to actually be able to do this with less knowledge, that is with knowledge that is available in inverse scattering. And uh, I showed you that, you know, this is very useful for solving inverse problems. So, in fact, after this experiment, uh, experience, we, you know, are not so positive on inversion approaches that are based on data fit. So it looks like, you know, uh, data are not so sensitive to changes in the medium. So it's much better to work with the reduced order model. You can think of it in a way as a nonlinear preconditioner type idea because we, we start with the data and we go to the reduced order model, you know, so uh, you, you can think of it like that if you want. And there are other ideas. So the reduced order model for the propagator can also be used for velocity estimation. It's not as good as what I showed you here, but it can be used, okay? And there are many, many things to, to do. Okay, so I think I should end here. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lillian. That was, uh, Liliana, that was, that was a great talk. Um, so for questions, uh, we realized that our, our Zoom uh, is missing our chat box here. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, please just raise your hand and uh, we will unmute you uh, and you can ask your question. Um, so I guess I'll start off. Um, I'm curious in the case of damped and driven media. Uh, so for example, if you have your um, uh, damping, is that just equivalent to a complex wave speed in your model? And you know, for driven systems, when you don't have your excitations placed at localized points in space, but like you vibrate the whole system, I'm just curious if there's any any uh, any way to approach that from from your approach. Okay, so so those are great questions. Okay, so damping is a problem. Uh, so uh, because if you put damping, uh, so yeah, so so damping is a problem because um, essentially you don't get a self-adjoint operator in that case. Okay, so that doesn't work. And in fact, I think there is very little known about inverse wave scattering in general in attenuating media, okay? Now, that being said, we have done ideas like this for heat equations, okay? Um, so for parabolic problems, and uh, we are also thinking of um, trying to, to work on, you know, dispersive media, which go hand in hand with damping, you know. Uh, so, but I think in that case, the time domain formulation is not a good one. I think one needs to go in a frequency domain and uh, uh, construct the use of the model um, uh, uh, that way. And there are, you know, there's all this, uh, technology with Lovner, I think they are called Lovner inner products and so on. So there are some things that one can do there. Okay. Now, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah. Now, in terms of the non-localized um, sensors, I, I'm not sure exactly what you meant by, so the sensors, so in fact, here, in, in the stuff that we did before, we really cared that the sensors are, you know, on one side of the medium. But for this particular project, the sensors can be anywhere, okay? So when we say, you know, and, and you know, the, the reason we wanted all this, the sensors to be here before was because we wanted this sort of like causal propagation of the wavefront away from the sensors. But you know, in, in fact, in fact, you know, you can have sensors inside if, if so you wish, you know, you're still gonna have a causal propagation. Algebraically, it's going to look the same, except that, you know, in the real space, you know, the propagation, you know, when, when you start, for example, the first reduced order model snapshot, you know, you are still going to get the first block non-zero and everything else is zero. But what does that mean? It means that you have 
the wave near the sensors and you know you could have some sensors here you could have some sensors here whatever okay so the so it's not in the physical space it's not so easy to track the wave but other than that you know the sensors could be inside now to actually have the wave field everywhere to have the snapshots everywhere i mean you know then it's a very easy inverse problem <laughs> Okay, so I don't, we don't want to do that because if you know the wave everywhere, it's very easy to solve for C. Yeah, so this is very of... different than the kind of stuff that I know Nathan worked on, you know, and many people from you guys, where you want to discover the equation. You don't know the equation, okay, or the dynamical system. So this is very different. You know, we know the equation, we just want the coefficient. Yeah, right. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, and yeah, I, you're. Uh, let me make sure that I understood the setup correctly. You have sensors which sort of emit an excitation and wait for that to propagate, and then they uh, detect the excitation later. Yes. Um, so I guess I was sort of envisioning the passive situation where the sensors are only detecting uh, the way ah. pattern and the whole system is being driven somehow. Okay, so that problem is actually an interesting problem. We eventually will get to that, okay? The calculus, is a little bit different there because so we we really liked this uh, this formulation you know where the data are in the symmetric form because everything could be done like that that doesn't mean you know so i think you can do this with this uh, i think what is called galerkin petrov formulation you know so so you 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 could try to do that kind of stuff you know we we haven't done it i mean we, we just haven't done it yet you know uh, but that's that's certainly a situation where um, you know um, I mean there is a lot of work to be done there. We haven't really looked at that problem so much because at least the folks that pay us they care more about you know uh, inverse scattering. You know, so the Air Force sits on the ground and sees stuff in the air and measures on the ground or the other way around. You know, and and the same for the Navy. So that's, uh, you know, that's why. But indeed, if you have transmission data, by the way, if you have transmission data, the, the, the traditional formulation is not so bad. I mean, it's still not as good, but, but it's not so bad. Let's yeah, put it that makes a lot of sense. Um, thanks so much. Um, yeah. I'll leave some room for uh, any other questions if uh, anybody wants to raise their hand. Okay, here we have a question. I'll uh, unmute. Um, hello, this is Abdu. Uh, I'm a PhD student in NC State University. Thanks, Dr. Ileyana, for this nice uh, presentation. Um, so I'm working on like um, uh, somehow similar uh, problem in geophysics and in biomedical imaging. And uh, I had the feeling that uh, uh, reduced order modeling, uh, uh, I mean, I faced some difficulties with uh, or at high frequencies. But uh, I think uh, it, the, the, the ROM you, re you presented today it does not have these issues with respect to high frequencies. Well, so you have to be careful what you mean by the reduced order model, right? So there is a lot of work in reduced order modeling for the forward problem. Okay, so I didn't say that actually, you know. So um, in fact, I thought I had a slide with the um, bottleneck of the calculations and so on. Um, so a lot of you know. So one idea of using reduced order modeling. Uh, didn't I have a yeah, here. So one idea in using reduced order modeling is to is to um, to speed up, you know, the solution of forward problem, and that's a completely different thing. That's a model driven reduced order model and so on. But yeah, yeah. I, I don't really know. So he, I mean, no, the high frequency plays no role. I mean, honestly, um, it's not. Uh, 
I, I don't see what the, the issue would be for high frequency here. Okay. Okay, thank you. And in fact, I, I didn't say the, 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 the numbers that we used here, but I think the, the central frequency of the signal that we had was 10 Hertz, which is, you know, the typical one used in geophysics. And of course, it's a band limited signal, so we don't have zero frequency, you know. Uh, so, uh, I mean, yeah. And okay. we, have, we have actually done this kind of stuff, not this particular project, but uh, we use the reduced order model for the ROM propagator. Uh, um, and, and for that, we actually use high frequency, like high, like, like they use, you know, in RADA, you know, like hundreds of kilohertz or, you know, stuff like that. So, and uh, there is no problem, I mean, yeah. So, uh, and uh, in terms of the computational cost per iteration, uh, so we, uh, I mean, comparing uh, the the method that you presented compared to the, for example, the standard uh, follow-up inversion. Yes. Uh, like, does it com like does it save uh, some time or? Okay, so here is so the computation of the reduced order model is extremely fast. If you, once you have the data, it's very fast. And moreover, you don't have to store much. You need to store the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix to, con to construct the reduced order model, okay? But you don't need to store, I mean, so you, you, you need to store these matrices. And the fact that, that you can do this in time windows helps, okay? Now, of course, I know, you know, when I used to be in Rice University with my colleague Bill Symes, I mean, he manipulated you know, like gigabytes or terabytes of data. Okay, I'm not sure about that. Okay, so we we are folks that compute on laptops and so on. Okay, so that's that's what we did. Uh, so I can tell you from our point of view, the bottleneck of the computation is solving the forward problem, which is something that the forward wave inversion also. I mean, the yeah, the the full waveform inversion also has to do. Everybody has to solve forward problem. Now. The, there is an advantage in the full waveform inversion uh, because the Jacobian can be calculated using the adjoint operator, you know. So here we haven't figured out yet how to use the adjoint. So what we are doing is we are computing the Jacobian using finite differences, which means that we have to solve a lot of forward problems. Okay, so that's the bottleneck for us. So, but that doesn't mean that one cannot compute the Jacobian, you know, in a more interesting way, in a, in a more clever way, but we haven't done it, okay? Yeah. Because it's, it's a little bit complicated, right? We have all these nonlinear mappings and we haven't figured out yet how to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks so much. Um, give uh, maybe one more question. If somebody has one, uh, feel free to raise your hand. And if not, um, maybe we should wrap it up. We're a little few minutes over time here. Um, so uh, let's everybody uh, thank our speaker again. Uh, it was a very informative talk. Um, and uh, we'll send out our next announcement on our, our mailing list uh, for the next uh, seminar in a few weeks. Um, okay, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.